at Sikamek First Nation. We are very proud to have them here. Thank you, guys. And we're also proud to have uh, First Nation, Atikamek First Nation here. Ladies, gentlemen, thank you for being here. They work so hard to where we are. So hey, welcome to the 30th Wikimania in Canada. Welcome. Come on. All right, my name is Benoit Rochon. I'm uh, the president of Wikimedia Canada. So, Canada is a country, a bilingual country. Yeah, I, let me, I have to finish my phrase. <laughs> so, it's a bilingual country. It, if you walk in the streets in Montreal, we, you will hear French, of course, but uh, you uh, also can speak to anyone in English. Don't worry, they can, you can also speak Spanish, Latinos over there. Of course, they will sing later. <laughs> They're always singing. Okay, so uh, we are very proud to have you here, Wikimedia Canada. The board is right here. Uh, we work so hard to make this happen uh, in such a, a short time. We're uh, very happy to have you around. Um, I'll do uh, so, some words in, in French if you don't mind. Uh, by the way, they have some, uh, there is some uh, translation available for people who doesn't understand French. There will be some tracks in French. So uh, you can get the earphones in the back here. So in the past couple uh, years, uh, Wikimedia Canada, uh, nous avons travaillé très fort pour uh, uh, amener où le chapitre là où il est aujourd'hui. Et uh, si je regarde dans le rétroviseur, je suis vraiment uh, très fier d'avoir, de savoir où ce qu'on est rendu. Benoît, je l'ai fait. De savoir où ce qu'on est rendu. L'ACFAS, l'association, euh, la Fondation Les Negros, évidemment, BANQ, Major Partner, BNQ. I hope you guys in your country will have such an institution like this to work with you. They are uh, very, uh, very good with us. So, I would like to present you Mrs. Maureen Clapperton, speaking of BNQ, Bibliothèque and Archive Nationale du Québec. So she is the directress, uh, general director of the National Library, Mrs. Maureen Clapperton. Bonjour. Monsieur Benoît Rochon, président de Wikimedia Canada. Madame Catherine Maher, directrice exécutive de la Wikimedia Foundation, chers membres du CA, distingués invités, bonjour, good morning. C'est une joie et un honneur pour moi d'être présente parmi vous ce matin pour saluer la fructueuse collaboration entre Wikimedia Canada et Bibliothèque et Archives nationales du Québec. Vous le savez, Wikimedia Canada est l'un des maillons du mouvement collaboratif mondial qui repose sur la participation citoyenne. Son objectif est de rendre le savoir de plus en plus accessible, gratuitement et partout. Par ailleurs, pour paraphraser la Déclaration des bibliothèques québécoises récemment publiée sur le site de l'UNESCO, vous pourrez aller le voir si vous voulez, BANQ est un bien collectif et un lieu où se développe une relation d'exploration, d'échange, de connaissance, de culture et d'enrichissement. Il était donc tout à fait naturel que notre institution se joigne à un projet d'enrichissement collaboratif des savoirs. Il va sans dire aussi que le vecteur multiplicateur qui est Wikimedia donne une visibilité sans précédent au patrimoine documentaire québécois. Notre riche collaboration établie depuis plus de trois ans déjà se décline en trois volets. Un premier dans Wikimedia Commons, où plus de 3000 images issues des fonds d'archives de BANQ ont été versées et peuvent dorénavant servir à illustrer des millions d'articles dans Wikipédia. Le deuxième volet 
consiste en activités de formation et en rédaction ouvertes à tous. Surnommé « Mardi, c'est Wiki », vous en avez sûrement entendu parler, ces ateliers sont offerts gratuitement à la Grande Bibliothèque et rendus accessibles par visioconférence. Ils permettent à des Wikipédiens comme vous êtes d'expérience et à des employés, les archivistes et les bibliothécaires de BANQ de partager leur expertise avec tous ceux qui désirent contribuer à l'encyclopédie en ligne. Et finalement, le troisième volet se concrétise dans Wikisource, où BANQ dépose des documents d'intérêt historique que les contributeurs sont invités à transcrire pour en faciliter la lecture ou encore permettre plus facilement la recherche de mots-clés. Des documents manuscrits et des imprimés anciens sont ainsi, trans sont ainsi transcrits par des francophones et francophiles partout dans le monde. Le potentiel de diffusion offert par l'univers Wikimedia est inégalé pour BANQ. En plus d'être une vitrine mondiale pour nos documents patrimoniaux, cet outil de rayonnement international permet de faire la promotion de l'histoire et de la culture québécoise auprès des 20 millions de francophones qui visitent Wikipédia chaque mois. C'est pas rien tout ça. Depuis plusieurs années déjà, il a été démontré que la collaboration entre les bibliothèques et l'univers Wiki euh, est grandement bénéfique pour les partenaires comme pour les citoyens. D'une part, l'association au milieu collaboratif permet aux bibliothèques qui se veulent toujours plus inclusives d'accueillir des gens intéressés par les nouveaux médias et les nouvelles formes d'appropriation des savoirs et des connaissances. D'autre part, cette association ouvre également une fenêtre sur le monde pour chaque bibliothèque locale. Pour sa part, l'encyclopédie en ligne Wikipédia aime aussi les institutions documentaires, particulièrement celles qui ont un caractère national, car ces institutions permettent de multiplier les sources fiables utilisées dans les articles par les contributeurs. Et bien sûr, BANQ est un ardent promoteur de cette fiabilité, tant recherchée par les utilisateurs d'Internet notamment, parce qu'elle est à la fois une bibliothèque nationale, des, bibli des archives nationales et une importante bibliothèque publique. BANQ rassemble, conserve et diffuse le patrimoine documentaire québécois et déploie ses activités dans 12 édifices sur tout le territoire du Québec. Pour ce faire, BANQ peut compter au quotidien sur un personnel dévoué et passionné qui mérite ici chaleureusement d'être chaleureusement remercié. Le partenariat avec Wikimedia Canada résulte d'ailleurs de l'initiative d'employés, encore une fois tant des archivistes que des bibliothécaires, qui tout au long du processus ont été appuyés par la haute direction. Ces professionnels de, de l'information ont su déceler dans l'utilisation des nouveaux médias et dans l'engagement citoyen, le fort potentiel de rayonnement de l'institution. La collaboration entre Wikimedia Canada et BANQ, une société d'État, est une première au Canada. Elle a donné lieu à un projet inédit au sein de la francophonie, dont plusieurs bibliothèques, musées et universités s'inspirent actuellement. Les administrateurs de Wikimedia Canada, quant à eux, ont fait l'éloge de notre partenariat lors de rassemblements internationaux et nous, sommes, et nous en sommes extrêmement reconnaissants de cet appui. Grâce à la qualité de la gestion du projet et au caractère audacieux de notre collaboration, BANQ s'est vu décerner en 2016 le prix Rayonnement international de l'Institut d'administration publique de Québec un prix que nous partageons, bien sûr, avec tous les employés de l'institution, mais aussi avec nos précieux partenaires. J'aimerais prendre quelques instants ici pour remercier tout particulièrement M. Benoît Rochon, président de Wikimedia Canada, anne Loane Fan de l'Association francophone pour le savoir, l'ACFAS, et Mathieu Gauthier-Pilote de la Fondation Lionel Groux de nous avoir accompagnés dans cette belle aventure qui se poursuit. Sans vous, sans l'appui de vos organisations, sans surtout votre enthousiasme, votre générosité, en temps et en conseil, 
la, colla la collaboration avec la communauté Wiki n'aurait pas eu le succès qu'elle connaît actuellement. En terminant, je vous convie à la conférence que prononceront Hélène Laverdure et Frédéric Giuliano dimanche matin. Ainsi, vous pourrez en apprendre un peu plus sur notre grande institution, son implication dans l'univers Wiki et les défis auxquels nous ferons face dans les prochaines années. N'oubliez pas non plus les visites de nos édifices à Montréal. Si vous avez le temps d'y aller, évidemment, je crois qu'il reste quelques places de disponibles. Au final, la démarche collaborative ancrée dans la technologie avec Wikimedia s'inscrit dans un mouvement beaucoup plus large, qui prend de plus en plus d'ampleur au sein de l'univers virtuel et que l'on nomme souvent, c'est un peu le concept, de l'intelligence collective. Cette démarche, à cause des étapes de validation et de la fiabilité des institutions qui s'y associent, vient soutenir les institutions démocratiques qui en qui sont un rempart pour la qualité et la fiabilité de l'information de nos jours. De tels projets doivent se poursuivre. Ils sont importants pour la société démocratique. Ils nous permettent de faire rayonner de façon inédite, innovante et branchée la culture québécoise sur la scène locale, régionale et internationale. Je vous remercie de votre attention et je vous souhaite un excellent congrès. Merci. Thank you, Mrs. Pepperton. I really wish you have such great institution like that. They will have some talk uh, Sunday morning, I guess, if I recall. And uh, we will present also all the major projects that we did. If you folks were here uh, last uh, Wednesday, we did a scanathon, so we saved some negatives that were oxidized, and they were over 100 years old. So we are very proud to uh, work with you, and Mrs. Clapperton. Thank you. Now, we are honored to have uh, Mr. Arut Chitian, who is uh, the Vice Chairman of the Executive Committee of the City of Montreal. He's also responsible for the administrative reform, smart city, information technology, and the youth. Mr. Arut Chitian. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Benoît et toute l'équipe de l'organisation qui a travaillé très fort pour organiser Wikimania ici, à Montréal. Donc, euh, je crois qu'on doit tous les applaudir pour cet énorme succès. Merci. First and foremost, I want to officially welcome all of the participants from across Canada, from across the world here to Montreal, our great city that is celebrating the 375th anniversary of Foundation. And I think this event is a natural to be happening here in Montreal because the city of Montreal has in the past years demonstrated its willingness to be first and foremost a human city. Why a human city? Because even in our strategy to make the city more connected, more digital, the first value that we bet it on heavily is not to be the most technologically advanced city. It's to use technology as a means to achieve quality of life, better services, and equality across the city. Second, we're a city that bets heavily on the fundamental value that Wikipedia was founded on, which is transparency, collaboration, and sharing. That's why two years ago, we became one of the cities from across the world who will open up all its data by default, deadline December 2018. And it is not enough to open the data, we have to provide our citizens, the stakeholders and the civil society with the tools to analyze that data. And one of the first tools that we developed here in the city of Montreal in a collaborative fashion is a tool to go and to search every single dollar that is being spent 
in contracts given out by the City of Montreal. We developed a tool to drill down and to see in a collaborative, transparent and open fashion also every single incident that is being handled by the Montreal Police. And there is much, much more to come in the coming years. Therefore, we salute the Wikimedia Foundation, Wikimedia Canada, but especially the founder, Jimmy Wales, who, who will honor us with his presence today. And we share all of the values that all you great people here are united to discuss and to exchange about. So long live Wikimedia, Wikipedia, all the different platforms. And if anybody here is interested to add to my Wikipedia page in English, I think it needs a good refresh. <laughs> Thank you, merci, and have a great day. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Yeah, that's the sort of energy. Um, <laughs> good morning, all. Thanks for being here. I am so excited to be here for Wikimania 2017. And to start off, I also want to say thank you to our sponsors who are making it possible for us to be here today. Uh, WikiHow, La Banque, Tourisme Montreal, Mapbox, Gamepedia, and Google. Thank you very much for your support for our work and for this community. <laughs> And of course, thank you so much to Wikimedia Canada for organizing and hosting this Wikimedia, or Wikimania. <laughs> As you've already heard, this is the first time that we're holding a Wikimania in Canada. Hopefully it will not be the last. It's also one of the first francophone Wikimanias. So it's really wonderful to see that represented. And of course, I also want to acknowledge that we are on the traditional and unceded territory of the First Nations of Canada and take a moment to recognize that. So thank you. I know I look forward to Wikimania all year long. It is three days of old friends and new friends, early morning talks and presentations, late night evening sessions that you're all familiar with. It is hallway conversations, stimulating panels, things that we learn about that for the first time, conversations that advance discussions that have been going on for a decade now. Wikimania is one of the moments in our community that we all get together from all over the world to talk about what is important to our mission, what is important to our movement. But I also want to recognize that for all the people that are here in the room, and I think there are about nearly a thousand of us here today in Montreal, that there are many of us who are not here. And so I want to acknowledge those who are watching on the live stream, those of us who are participating remotely, but also those of us who are not able to attend because of visa challenges. And I want to take this moment to acknowledge and let announce that for those of you who are not able to attend, for those of us who are not in the room, that you will automatically be qualified if you received a scholarship this year but were unable to receive a visa for a scholarship next year to come to Cape Town. So that... Because our movement is about openness and collaboration and we want to make sure that those of us who are not able to attend for reasons outside of the control of our Wikimedia movement are still always welcome and always able to participate. So really excited about that. I also want to acknowledge and take a moment to recognize something that many of you may have heard about in the past week. It was determined last week that Basil Khartabio, our colleague and fellow Wikimedian and free culture advocate from Syria, had been executed in 2015, shortly after he went missing from the prison where he had been detained. I wanted to take this opportunity while we're all gathered here to recognize his contributions to our community and to the broader free culture movement. And I wanna take a moment to bring some of Basil's friends and colleagues up onto the stage to remember him and to also make an announcement about how we plan to honor his legacy. Would you like to join me?
So I am joined here on stage by Habib Haddad, a friend, colleague of Basel's, also from Yala Startup. <laughs> um, sorry. By John Phillips of the New Palmyra Project. By Ryan Merkley, the CEO of Creative Commons. By Mark Sermon, the executive director of the Mozilla Foundation. And by Barry Drew, also from the New Palmyra Project. Yeah, it's okay. We can applaud. <laughs> They are all friends and allies of our movement, and they are all friends and friends of Basel's. And so I want to hand the microphone over to John, who's going to talk a little bit about the project that they've been working on, which is off to our left. Hi, Wikimedians. Good morning. So Basil Cardabel is was my best friend, and he is exactly like you. I actually was going through my old emails, and I found the first time I ever talked to him. It was just a really casual gift he gave me, which was a patch to my project Open Clip Art. And I think that signifies Basil and the work that he has done. It's nameless, it's small, it's not in your face. It's, he probably wouldn't be on stage right now. He'd be somewhere out in the back hacking right now. He's a committer. He was someone who was really gifted in giving back and giving to his society. He was reconstructing uh, the ancient city Palmyra and we, we relaunched this project called New Palmyra in his honor as well, which there's going to be an edit-a-thon later today about this and more. Um, Basil is a committer. I think that's the message. He is one of the great ones that his light was just extinguished too early. So please, every time today and the, uh, tomorrow when you're working on wiki edits, you're doing other things, um, just remember that maybe down the line, you don't know where you're going to be. You don't know where your friend's going to be. Just think about that. Think about your friends and the people you meet at this event. You don't know what's coming next. So with that, I'm going to give the mic to Ryan. Thank you. Um, this, uh, this is a sculpture from a new Palmyra 3D model. This is actually entirely 3D printed. Um, it's 250 pounds of plastic uh, produced by a model that Basil produced. Um, and we uh, brought it here for all of you to see. So come up close, have a look at it, read the boards, learn about Basil, and it'll be in the East Ballroom for the balance of the weekend. Um, it underscores something for me, which is the work that we do, the work that you do, that we do together is political. Um, and we can't question that anymore. Um, people lose their lives for things that we take for granted. And for those of us who work in environments where that work is okay and safe, that's a privilege. And we have a responsibility to those who work in environments where it's not. And to <laughs> Basil was a leader in many movements, and most of you don't belong to one movement. I'm a Wikipedian, I'm a Mozillian, I'm a creative commoner, I support EFF, and many of you could call out many, many other organizations that you're part of. Um, we need to stick together as an open movement, um, and you'll hear about that over the course of the whole week, and it's why we're here. Uh, it's why we come to these events, to be with you, to be part of this movement. So we've come together to try to honor Basil's legacy, and so today, um, these organizations, Creative Commons, Mozilla, Wikimedia Foundation, the Jimmy Wales Foundation, um, and New Palmyra are announcing the Basil Cartabill uh, Free Culture Fellowship. Uh, we're announcing that today, right here, right now. It's, it's supported financially by all of these organizations. There's a blog post that we're launching concurrently with all the details, which I won't get into. But we'll put out the call for people, especially those who live in environments where they are in danger for doing the kind of work that we ask people to do every day as volunteers and colleagues. We want to support them, we want to get their backs, and we want to help them do the work that they do so that we can all benefit from free culture and open knowledge. Thank you. So uh, I am at Basel in 2009, and it was actually in, uh, in Jordan when Creative Commons was expanding to the Middle East. And um, I, that time, I saw only one small facet of Basel. Little did I know that he was not just an uh, open rights uh, activist. Uh, he actually was a 
social entrepreneur. He helped, uh, helped me actually bring a group of Syrian entrepreneurs to Beirut in 2010 to build a big movement on, on startups. He was an innovator. He actually built a company with you, uh, IKE, IKE Labs. He, was, he built a hackerspace in Syria where he hosted all the geeks to come and, and work on things. He was a, a journalist. Actually, he got into jail a few times because he's right, he, he wrote his views at that time on religion. Uh, he was an artist. Actually, I discovered that after he went to jail. He was an activist, <laughs> then was jailed, and then in jail, he actually started painting, writing, uh, and was a poet. And now that we're actually looking at his, uh, his letters, we're seeing that he's sending, he had sent letters of asking his friends to, to get publishing rights for some books, but he was translating in jail, and he was saying, well, my dad would be happy actually to, to type those. So uh, Basil's story, Basil is a unique individual, and he was amazing, but his story is not actually unique. Um, and thousands of bastards exist out there. In fact, yesterday night, as I was walking down the lobby, this, the, the funniest story happened. Uh, I, I introduced Catherine to, to this lady. So, so the lady on the counter looked at me and smiled. I was like, I know this person. And then I walked up, and she's like, hey, my name is such and such. You were my mentor in Jordan. It's like, I, I didn't even know. Like, I didn't even put you here. Like, how did you come here? She said, well, I was threatened in Aleppo, as you know. And my parents lost everything. We lost all the cash. We moved to Jordan. Uh, I had to build my, my startup there in health, in health food. Uh, you helped me, you mentored me, but then I had to build myself up. And then I moved out. All my family is still there. I'm here now. I'm working in this hotel, and I'm building more cash to build another company uh, after I'm done. So this is the story of uh, the individuals the fellowship is actually uh, in, in encouraging. Basil's story is not unique. There's many of them out there. Um, I'll end on, on one poet, a poem actually. Um, a friend of mine, a common friend of ours, Muhammad Najem, uh, was exchanging letters with, with Basil in prison. And uh, there's a poem that's actually apparently uh, the favorite poem of Basil and his wife, Noura. So it's in Arabic, I read and I'll try, I'll try to translate. So it starts. Glory to us, those who stood, while God has suppressed our names. We defy destruction. We take refuge in an immortal mountain. They call it the people. We want to run. We want to immigrate. And there was my heart threaded by the wounds. And there was my heart done by the dissection. Resting now above the remains of the city like a rose from rot. Hadian, calmly. After it said no to the ship and I love my country. And I think this really represents Basel. He decided to stay back in Syria. Every, some people fled and were able to get a better life out there. He stayed there. And so, you know, on a, on a more uplifting note, uh, we are celebrating his life, and we want his spirit to keep on going. So I'd like you all to repeat after me, when I say a word, uh, just to stick it up to whoever was put, put, put him and was, was putting many others, suppressing other voices. I uh, want you to, 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 to scream after me uh, the following words. Ya'ish Basel, which means long live Basel. So Ya'ish Basel. I'm going to count to three, and we're going to do it a few times. So Ya'ish Basel, you can train now. Yeah, okay. okay. One, two, three. Yaish Basel. One more time. Basel. One last time. Yaish Basel. Thank you. <laughs> Do you want me to announce that? I can. Oh, go for it. Yeah. yeah. So it's not, yeah. Uh, one of the reasons why John and I and people that are, have supported Basil's work are here is just to meet everybody and talk to you and just quickly, there are two opportunities to do that. Uh, one of them is tomorrow, uh, there's an edit-a-thon, I believe it's from 11 to 2, it's in the programming, or on the website Saturday at least. Afternoon. Saturday afternoon. Saturday afternoon. Afternoon? says afternoon. I think <laughs> it moved. Anyway, look on the programming, it's, I, it, it's moved around a little bit. Uh, the it's second, on wiki. And, it's on wiki. The, it's on the wiki. It's on the wiki. It's on the wiki. <laughs> and where am I? Um, 
And um, the second thing is we're having a party tonight on a more uplifting note. Um, you know, these are heavy topics, but you know, one of Basil liked to party. We like to, you know, unwind a little too. So at the at eight, from eight to eleven tonight at the SAT, uh, it's pretty close to here. It's the Society des Arts uh, Technologiques. Um, everybody's invited to show up. Um, we're gonna have a good time. So please have all your friends come there. Thank you. We'll make sure to get the details of the party on Wiki and also in the Telegram groups for those of you who'd like to socialize later, have a drink, enjoy the company of others, and celebrate Basel's life and the life of so many others who are creative and open and committed to our mission and bring more joy into the world every day for more people. Um, so I was going to announce the edit-a-thon, but John has already done that. And so do come and check out the new Palmyra project sculpture throughout the course of the day. As we said, it's moving to another ballroom. It's incredible. The more up close you get to it, the more detail that reveals itself. It's truly a remarkable legacy. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it over to Phoebe, our Wikimedia, Wikimania program co-chair. Co oh my goodness. Um, thanks, Phoebe. Welcome to Wikimania 2017! I am so glad to be here. Thank you to Catherine. Thank you to the Basel group. This is amazing. It's going to be a good party. Um, and we are here because we believe in open education and free knowledge for all. And that is an aspirational promise and a sometimes dangerous promise. And we are going to talk about our future this weekend in an uncertain world and what our strategy is going to be to meet that future. And we're also going to talk about our hopes, our successes, our experiments, and our plans. We are going to talk about how we can build a better community, better technology, how we can keep improving and about some of our very coolest projects. Um, and we are here because, as always, we are continuing to build an open world together. So I'm honored to be this year's program co-chair. Uh, I want to thank everyone, uh, but especially my amazing program committee. We had over 400 submissions this year, which I think might be more than ever before. Um, there's been a lot of changes on the wiki, as you all know. Um, and so I especially want to thank Duror Lin and Guillaume Pommier, my co-chairs, for once again bringing order into chaos. I want to thank, personally, our on-site logistics team, without whom this would not have happened. Uh, Ellie Young, Louise Wo, Aaron Lacey, Irene Tate. Um, you guys are superstars. And I want us to give a special round of applause for Benoit Rochon and everyone at Wikimedia Canada for making this happen. Um, I have the job of telling you some pieces of information you need to know. So some housekeeping items you need to know. Um, the schedule's on the wiki. Uh, that should be the latest version. The edit-a-thon is 11 to 4 tomorrow. We made it longer. Um, uh, so the schedule's on the wiki. Um, tonight we have a reception in the community village, which is next door, but also there are posters downstairs. Go check out these amazing posters that we have. You'll get dinner on your own after that, and then you'll go to Basel's party or explore the great city of Montreal. Um, you can also schedule an informal meetup if you would like. There is a meetups board out front. You might have seen it with the yellow signs. There's also a page on the wiki. We have rooms all over this, all over this venue. Um, and in addition to the formal program, uh, there's a couple of spaces I want to draw your attention to. So there is a hacking space, uh, Salon 7, which is open 24-7 for quiet work. There's also uh, Salon 6, the movement strategy space, uh, where they're going to be talking about movement strategy during the whole conference. Drop in, hang out. Um, I saw some lawn chairs in there. I don't know. Um, go see what's going on in there. 
The second thing, note-taking. We're going to be using Etherpad for note-taking during the conference. Um, there is a template for the Etherpad linked on the program page and linked on the speaker information page. Make an Etherpad for the sessions you go to. Take notes in there. Link it to the program abstracts. Um, and take pictures, right? Like, we encourage everyone to take pictures of this conference and document it and put those pictures on commons. But pay attention to people's lanyards. Yellow lanyards are no photos this year. So again, if you see someone with a yellow lanyard, please do not put them in your pictures or videos. Um, we have a ton of communications channels for this conference, as many of you already know. There's a Telegram group. There's two Telegram groups. There's a Telegram group. There's a mailing list. Our hashtag is Wikimania. Um, hashtag Wikimania. And um, you'll see me again on stage. I'll be making announcements. So if you want the whole conference to know something, find me. Um, and lastly, if you have some kind of a problem while you're here, an issue comes up, Find someone with the event staff badge or just go to the help desk here on level four, okay? But I want you to do three things while you're here as participants. The first thing is we have a friendly space policy for this conference. It says we do not tolerate harassment of any kind. Familiarize yourself with that policy. It's linked on the wiki. Um, I also, though, want you to be welcoming to your fellow attendees. We have people here that, where this is their first Wikimania, and we have people here that this is their 13th Wikimania. And I want you to find someone that you don't know and explore this conference together and learn from each other. I also want you to learn something this weekend. Could be something big, could be something small. In a workshop, in the community village, learn from each other while you're here. And third, I want you to solve a problem this weekend. This is a working conference. We are participants. Wikimania is not a spectator sport. So build something, solve a problem. Maybe you're wondering how to deploy Wikidata-driven info boxes on your language. Good news, we have a session on that. Maybe you are wondering just how to do better outreach in your community. Learn from the people who are here and pledge to solve some kind of problem that you have faced in your free knowledge work while you're here. Um, and have a good time. Wikimania is magical. And I am so glad, I am so glad you are all, you are all here. And now I would like to turn it over to an old friend of mine. Um, Evan Perdomu is an entrepreneur, a wiki pioneer, um, and a Montrealer, and um, he is the founder of Wiki Travel StatusNet. He's currently working on a startup called Fuzzy.ai. Um, and Evan is going to moderate our wonderful keynote session with Jimmy Wales and Biella Coleman in conversation. So, Evan, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am really excited to be uh, part of this conversation because I'm getting to talk with two of the people that I respect most in the free culture movement um, and uh, helping them to uh, have a conversation. I hope that will be really interesting for all of you. Um, in true wiki fashion, uh, well, whenever we have a problem, we start a wiki page. Um, we are going to be doing uh, questions from the audience for this uh, period. Uh, they are going to be on the wiki. Uh, so it's on the Wikimania wiki. There's a page called Questions for Friday, Questions for Friday. Uh, and we're going to be putting together those questions in uh, document mode. So I've got, I'm reloading it every few minutes on my, on my phone. So I will be uh, pulling questions from there. Um, so please feel free to add questions, integrate questions, combine questions on there. Um, and now I'd like to introduce our two keynote speakers. Uh, first of all, uh, a woman who holds the most Game of Thrones sounding title that I've ever heard. She is the wolf chair of uh, uh, technology and, and science liter literacy at uh, McGill. Uh, she has written uh, two great books. Um, I get the anonymous one. Uh, she's written two great books, the Debian one and the anonymous one. 
Um, uh, so Debian, what is uh, coding freedom? And the anonymous one is hacker hoax, hoaxer whistleblower spy. Uh, and she is a really interesting person who understands a lot about our movement and has a lot of interesting things to say. Her name's Biela Coleman. Come on up, Biela. And next, a man who needs no introduction, but I'm going to do it anyways. Uh, Jimmy Wales, founder of uh, Wikipedia, founder of everything we're doing here. Uh, Wikia, uh, founder of a new venture, uh, Wiki Tribune, um, and uh, a, uh, one of uh, Time's 100 most important people in the world. I love that one. Uh, please come on up, Jimmy. Hello. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, I think we're in a really interesting place with uh, with Wikipedia and Wikimedia uh, projects uh, in 2017. I think that uh, when we were first starting these projects, uh, there was a lot of questions about reliability and and where we uh, where we stood in the world in terms of uh, uh, providing information. And yet now we are one of the cornerstones of truth uh, and reliability uh, on the internet. Um, what, how did Wikipedia change from being this kind of wild, wild west to being the place you go for reliable information? Well, I mean, I think one of the things is that uh, in the in the early days of Wikipedia, of course, uh, we were just getting started, and so things weren't as good as we would like them to be. But there was also, uh, I think, a lot of misunderstanding in the press. Uh, we weren't as we were never as bad as we were made out to be, um, and certainly, I, I don't recall ever there being a time in the community where we felt like, oh, it's write whatever you like. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. It's wild, wild west, and uh, we always wanted to get to quality. Mm -hmm. um, and so when there would be an error, uh, then the press would make a big deal out of it and so forth. But what they didn't necessarily make a big deal out of is that how passionate we were about trying to fix it. Uh, but I also think that there's been a, a trend. Obviously, the more mature Wikipedia gets, the higher quality it gets. But also, I think we've seen a decline in the quality of other sources um, in the media and so forth, uh, which it's, it's not a, a great way to look better by everybody else being worse. Uh, it's not good for society, but it is true that people, um, you know, when, when they were complaining about Wikipedia, they never uh, imagined how much fake information could be online that you literally, it, it looks like you can trust it, but you actually can't trust it. And that sort of feeling that people have of, I don't know what's going on, um, it just wasn't there. And now, uh, that is something that people are grappling with. So, um, can people hear me? Yeah, makes sense. Oh, hello. So, just to add a little bit to that, I mean, first of all, I think you're absolutely right. Like the the press will will frame things, and they kind of stopped. And sometimes I, I secretly think that journalists all go to the Wikipedia page first to read up on what they have to write about, and uh, eventually they kind of had to stop dissing it. Um, I also know from the perspective of kind of being an educator, uh, there were, you know, five, ten years ago, some educators were unhappy if students went to Wikipedia initially, but that's not the case anymore. And in fact, many class projects kind of encourage students to edit the Wikipedia page. And I also think part of that uh, transition is the fact that pages went from kind of having basic overviews to kind of having very detailed um, kind of sometimes very esoteric takes where a lot of experts were contributing to Wikipedia and not contesting Wikipedia as well. And so with the support of experts both being contributors and non-skeptics, that also really helped with that transition. So I, I think one thing that's been really interesting, you know, in light of some of the recent controversies like uh, Fontgate um, and, uh, you know, Gamergate before it, um, what is on the Wikipedia page is what's true. Uh, that is the definition of truth. And in, if you can change that page and get, get the information on, on the page, um, what role do we have as a community 
and uh, do, do the documents that we create have in defining truth? What, where are we in a post-truth world? Where does, where does the truth we define matter? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, it's a, it's, I, I feel that it's a very heavy responsibility uh, that we've chosen for ourselves to, uh, and and to realize that when people come to Wikipedia, they do have that sense of trust uh, far more. I mean, all of us knowing how the sausage is made, it's a little bit disconcerting. It's like, oh, you actually trust us? Uh, oh dear. I mean, we try our best, but, um, and, uh, you know, for, for things like uh, uh, Gamergate is, a, is yeah. a good example where uh, there were, it, it was an area that was contested by people on both sides who were from outside the Wikipedia community who tried to flood in and tried to sort of control the narrative in Wikipedia, which of course, we've seen this many, many times before, but this was a particularly prominent case, mm -hmm. where it becomes, I think for us, the real challenge is to, uh, to maintain a sort of distance and uh, a real sense of neutrality in the sense of, particularly if, if one side is being particularly more annoying than the other, <laughs> right? then the temptation is to be biased against that side, but we have to resist that temptation, just describe the facts as best we can uh, using reliable sources and, and so forth. Um, and it's, I, I find it remarkable that, um, you know, we, we have managed to create a culture of responsibility uh, that's thanks to all the people in this room, um, where we're not, we're not like Reddit. Uh, we're not like lots of places online, and of course we have our human dramas. I mean, obviously we're human beings, and there's plenty of wiki drama to go around. But at the end of the day, there's there's such a large number of people who are just committed to just let's try and get it right, um, and let's try to get all the drama out and just like get on with the work. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I'm not you know, convinced we're in a post-truth moment in so far as many of the dynamics around propaganda and misinformation have been around for a long time, but we are in an interesting moment where there's a kind of new conversation and visibility about it because precisely we're online talking about it and also there's all sorts of new tools uh, from bots um, to these platforms that kind of contribute to it. And what I think I really um, admire about uh, Wikipedia is that they take truth seriously, but also I think the process of um, the very laborious process of editing pages kind of demonstrates a quality about truth um, that Oscar Wilde I think really captured well with one of his beautiful af aphorisms, which is um, the truth is rarely pure and never simple, right? So while I think in some cases we can raise our hands and go, oh my gosh, there's these climate change deniers, or wow, I can't believe some people can't see the truth, or they're misled. In fact, both convincing people of the truth, arriving at the truth, is a really difficult enterprise. It's difficult in science, um, it's difficult in journalism, and it's difficult for Wikipedia as well. And I think one of the reasons, again, why Wikipedia has become a kind of bastion uh, for truth and people trust it is precisely because you can see the process to get there. And that's a really big deal. You can't even see that with trusted newspapers, right? Mm -hmm. How did they necessarily get to this story? Why did they get there? Why are they using these sources? Yeah. That kind of conversation's not there. So that's one element. And while I do think you know, many of us do trust um, leading newspapers like the Washington Post, New York Times, and so on and so forth, I think there still is something different about a nonprofit community project um, who's producing this material. Because in the end, you're doing it for the sake of the project. People are not getting paid. You don't have to make money off of it. And this kind of um, is one of the reasons why I think there is integrity in the project, and people also feel that way as well. And one of the things I always joke is, I wish the New York Times would occasionally write, the neutrality of this article has been disputed at the top. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> uh, to acknowledge, right, as we acknowledge quite clearly, like, actually, we're still struck, we're, we're grappling here. Um, and, you know, we tend to write in a very authoritative style, but at least we admit uh, when we're, we're, we're grappling, 
the major newspapers write in an authoritative style, but they, they very seldom admit that they're not sure. Right. I, you know, we yeah. had a huge fight in the newsroom about this, and we decided to run this, but here's some warnings for you. They just don't do that, and they should. There's actually a really excellent um, debate between Glenn Greenwald and Bill Keller, um, which is about the role of bias in news, right? And whether you can have kind of fact-based, but um, uh, bias, but fact-based news, which is Glenn Greenwald's position and Bill Keller's is kind of, you can't, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, I actually, I'm, I'm not gonna like go deep in the debate, um, but I do think it is really important to um, sometimes acknowledge when you do have a bias, that's a kind of form of neutrality if you're very explicit about it as well, right? And some newspapers do that, some do not, right? But what I like again about Wikipedia is that it makes the process very clear of what they mean by neutrality and the process to get there is sometimes not neutral in terms of the discussion and the fight to get there. Yeah, and, and, and there is a huge difference, and this is what I think a lot of people are finding disconcerting about the current uh, political climate, is there's a big difference between, uh, let's say, a newspaper having a particular point of view, arguing a case, but in a fact-based way. So it is argumentative and it is biased in a sense, but in a fact-based way versus completely like playing at deuces wild and like you, you just have no idea uh, which the mainstream major papers aren't doing that but there's loads of places online that that are doing that um, so including at least one that's been recently rejected as a source by the Wikipedia community um, where the you know the, the actual facts seem to have very little impact on what they actually put forward so yeah, I, I think that there's a, uh, like a, in, in a lot of publications, uh, well, definitely in social media, in a lot of publications, the, the, the byline comes first, right? It's right up at the top there. Um, you know, we've gotten used to, in the last, you know, decade of, of having individuals kind of express themselves and having an absolute uh, control of their own expression, uh, whereas, uh, all of our wiki projects are very communitarian, right? So to find the, uh, find the individual contributions, you have to go to the talk pages, you have to go to the edit, edit histories in, to, in order to find that, that individual. Um, ha, like, why does that work? We're, we're in the selfie age where individuals are looking for attention. Why are we able to push individuals to the background and still be successful? Well, I mean, I, I think there's a, there is kind of a misconception there. So it is true, there's no bylines on Wikipedia entries, but in terms of social validation, I think most Wikipedians um, take great pride in doing work that other Wikipedians think is great work. So it's doing work that is impressive to people who you are respectful of yourself, and that's what really matters. And also in the abstract to know that your work is increasingly respected by the general public. Uh, and that's very different from a kind of a fame-seeking, uh, you know, like, and I don't mean that necessarily in a negative way. So if someone wants to be a blogger and make a name for themselves by having cogent and interesting opinions, that's great too, but it's just not what we're about. But it doesn't mean that we're working without any kind of social validation of what we're doing. I mean, that's, that's, I think, precisely right, that um, people gain recognition among peers, and that's very satisfying, um, and a way where the individual can shine. But it's also the case that some very large, complicated projects can only be um, achieved collectively, right? And it's awesome to be part of that large, awesome project that is having this huge impact in the world, and people feel incredibly proud to be part of that. And so you have the best of both worlds. You can get um, recognition from your peers, uh, but then you also know that by kind of holding hands and working together, there's this collective thing and you're attached to it and you don't feel the need to have yourself attached to it outside in the greater world. Um, and yeah, Wikipedia kind of satisfies both as well as I think other large successful free software projects. Yeah, I, I, so, you know, talking about other large, large projects, you know, again, uh, you know, my history with this project goes back uh, 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 several years, and so I kind of compare now and then, and 
one of the things that I think is, is different now than then is that you know, uh, around foundation time, we had kind of this inevitableism about free culture and free software. That you know, once we start a project, like inevitably it will dominate in its, in its area and its field. Um, and I think the last decade has shown that that's not the case. There are a number of projects that were started um, and, have not, um, and have not flourished. Uh, what have, uh, whereas say Wikimedia projects continue to grow and grow, what have the Wikimedia uh, project communities as well as the foundation, what have they done right that others may not have done as well? Uh, <laughs> if only we knew, we could go out into other areas and, and make it happen there as well. Um, I mean, I, I think a part of it is that there, there just is a nice fit. Like, people enjoy writing an encyclopedia, and it's useful in the end. And the, I mean, I, when I think of this question, I think of here's some grand, uh, here's one grand idea that didn't happen, mm -hmm. uh, and that's uh, that Linux on the desktop or, you know, free, free software desktop. Uh, would eventually clearly come to dominate as, and that's not happened, uh, and there's a lot of reasons why that ha hasn't happened, and of course, I'm not expert enough to, to put forward too specific of views, but it's things like the, the type of work necessary to make a fantastic desktop environment is uh, not that fun for free software developers who are more interested in more intellectual problems, or it requires a type of top-down, sort of Apple-style draconian framework that doesn't really work with an open community. I don't know the exact answer, but that's, that's one of the ones where I would say maybe it's just not possible. Maybe it's not the failing of any one person or group of people to not have done it the right way. It's like maybe that's just not something you can do in this way. I, I don't know. I'm not as familiar with uh, Wikipedia, so I can't speak to why they succeeded, but I know many other kind of open projects, some of which have wildly succeeded, like Debian, and the Debian Developer Conference is going on right now, to others like Indie Media, which I was quite involved in, and um, kind of grew exponen uh, exponentially in a few years, and is not really around anymore. And I think you know one of the core um, elements that allow projects that are primarily online to really grow and thrive is that it is really important to meet in person. Mm -hmm. um, and those projects that, that don't do that, and this happened with Indie Media, um, somehow the online interaction may not be quite enough, right? So these sorts of events are incredibly important. But you also have to configure the project in such a way that those people who don't necessarily come um, can still feel connected, right? It's not that everyone needs to come to these events, but they're kind of particularly important. I think the other um, interesting element is when to create policy, you know? Uh, Wikipedia has policy, Debian has policy, right? And this also allows a project to reproduce itself over time, but if you kind of have too much policy too early, it could be a little stifling, because it kind of has to kind of emerge organically. But if you have none, I've seen projects kind of just wither away. And part of the problem, I think, is that there is this idea that these projects are totally ad hoc, peer to peer, and they just work because people are really enthusiastic and into it. Whereas no, you do need some structure, uh, but people don't want overwhelming structure, and it's kind of finding that right balance that I think really matters for these and, online projects. And, and I do, I think that is absolutely crucial. Uh, so at, at Wikipedia, there are certain core policies, uh, neutral point of view, NPOV is non-negotiable, one of our oldest statements. We don't debate about, oh, should we become the Catholic encyclopedia or the lefty encyclopedia? Okay. It's just not even open for question. And that framework is, is, is meaningful, and it helps us get our work done. But also, like, the detailed rules, I mean, typically in Wikipedia, what we have done is, we, it's not like we, we make policy and then follow it. Policy is writing down our practices uh, that evolve over time, and certainly in the in the early days, you know, the first time we, we had the 
uh, BLP policy, Biography of Living Persons policy in English Wikipedia, it wasn't like we suddenly decided, oh, okay, well, we have to be ethical about biographies. It was like, oh, actually, we have these views and this is what we're doing. We need to codify that and actually make it clear to people that this is what has to be done. And that's important in a, in a, in a lot of communities. So I, uh, let's just talk about Reddit as an example. Reddit uh, began with, and I, I love Reddit and I hate Reddit and all those things, um, but it began with a really kind of we're uncensorable, wide open, free speech zone, and that is a core value in a certain sense of a large swath of that community, which meant as soon as they realized, like, actually, that's pretty horrible, and it creates horrible spaces within Reddit, and we need to do something about it, they've really struggled with that, because they never had a, an identity in the community that we've had, which is, okay, this isn't a wide open, free speech zone, we're trying to make an encyclopedia. Um, and I'm not sure what initial policy Reddit could have adopted. Uh, it's, it's a hard question in a sort of a chat forum, but um, it, 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 those initial principles do make a huge difference as to where you end up, even though you can postpone detailed rulemaking until later. Yeah, I, th I, I think that that's an interesting part of not only, <coughs> um, not only the, the Wikimedia projects, uh, but free software, uh, kind of as it as a whole, we've always been kind of these rule followers, right? Like we always kind of draw within the lines. Um, if you you know if you were the kind of person who who wanted to avoid copyright paranoia or ignore all rules, um, that that area has kind of been squeezed out of of Wikimedia uh, projects. Um, and so we're, we're kind of like in the lawful good area of the DoD matrix. And, and I think that there are, but there are associated uh, organizations, projects, ideas, movements um, that are more chaotic good, that are more chaotic neutral. Sorry, I'm going really deep into this analogy. Um, so, you know, and, and Biela, you've, you know, dealt quite a bit with that with, with Anonymous. Like, what is the relationship between these kind of hacker collectives that are doing, that are, that are you know, going over the lines uh, with projects like, like Wikimedia? Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting because my first project was on Debian, which is one of these kind of um, really let's stay within the law so much so that we'll invent our own law, you know, yeah. around the copyleft and it's, um, really transparent, accessible, and then all of a sudden I went to the total opposites, which was anonymous, which was totally chaotic, and people were, you know, breaking the law left and right and doing some really wild things. And, you know, speaking very personally right now, um, what I find really interesting and important is that I do think that um, people who care about the internet, whether you come at it um, as a technologist or a librarian or a citizen, you know, over the last 20, 25 years, we've really seen a political movement grow around the internet and related values from privacy to transparency to information access. And I'm of the personal belief that it's very important to have a diverse movement and different tactics. Um, and this is the case for different reasons. Some are very pragmatic. So, for example, um, sometimes um, if you need to bring attention to an issue, having kind of these crazy hackers um, hack into a company and take information, post it online, and create a video is a really wonderful way for the media to report on the issue. And it's not that everyone's going to necessarily agree with that tactic, but it can have a place in some ways. Um, but it's really, really important to have other kind of sectors and domains that stay within the bounds of the law and others which are working with policy. I just think that the more kind of vectors you have to work on a certain issue, um, it will then bring in different types of people because people have different styles of engaging politically in the world. Now there are moments where perhaps things get a little bit too crazy and you're like, well, maybe I just can't support that um, direct action, and it's okay to talk about it, right? But a movement that can kind of tolerate that difference, especially if certain ends are being met, can be very effective. And I know with Anonymous, it was very interesting. They were very controversial, and some individuals in this kind of movement hated them, others loved them, 
Um, some people secretly love them. I, I knew people in the kind of nonprofit hacker world who were like, well, I can't say it publicly, but I'm really glad they're doing what they're doing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but it, I do think it signals that the movement around these issues have become mature enough that there is a diversity of tactics to fight for these elements. Uh, but I also think it's important to have a conversation about why we may disagree with some of these tactics without having such kind of vitriol and fragmentation that people can't talk to each other. Yeah, it's a, it, I, I mean, it's a interesting <coughs> how, how those, you know, those different allied communities um, or loosely working towards some similar goals and, and in, in some ways different goals um, have a lot of the same rhetoric. Uh, I, I think one of the things that's probably been troubling for, for people in, in this community and, and other places is that you know, a lot of those, uh, those banners of internet freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, have been used to uh, harass or abuse uh, uh, people online, right? Um, and I guess you know one of the things that that's probably interesting for us to talk about is you know how are those balanced out? How how are those freedoms versus uh, people's right to not be harassed um, balanced out, and especially online? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, that's a, it's a really, really tough problem, and it's one f for us um, because we have an objective of building an encyclopedia, uh, and we're not a wide open free speech zone. I think it's a little bit easier. We just say no personal attacks, and we really do expect a high standard of behavior of ourselves and others within the Wikimedia community, within Wikipedia. Of course, we fight, you know, as human beings. But in general, uh, everybody understands that that's just not okay to attack other people personally. Um, I'm actually a little bit sympathetic you know, to a platform like Twitter, which has an enormous problem with abuse. I mean, really enormous. But it's also a place where you're supposed to go and post your opinions and, and mm -hmm. the thoughts that flick through your mind and so on. And people will argue and they will make personal attacks on famous people or not famous people and so forth and really figure out how to stop people from going too far, uh, I don't know, it's a really hard problem for them. Um, I'm glad we don't have that problem, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think in one sense, um, the issue, at one level, it's not complicated in so far as, you know, a person who's being targeted and harassed um, is basically put in a position where they can't speak out, right? Mm -hmm. So their ability to speak freely is infringed. Um, and so there's you know, really no room for that. The problem is, of course, it's just difficult to deal with in some instances precisely because certain tools for anonymity, which are so important for Probably dissidents, important, yeah. uh, enable that. So that's the tough part at some le level. But um, you know, <laughs> platforms are doing more or less a good job. Um, I think one of the important things is that when someone is being harassed, that people jump in in support of them. You know, that can make a really, really big difference. And I think in the last few years, that's what has happened a bit more. I mean, I, I remember when Kathy Sierra a long time ago was attacked uh, by a lot of trolls. You know, the, the kind of blogger community then was like, you know, deal with it. This is what, what happens. Whereas today, the discourse has kind of changed. Mm -hmm. And if someone's being attacked, there's kind of really interesting um, sometimes counterattacks, uh, people really speak up in support of the person. And so this, these little shifts, even if they don't fix the problem, I think are at least a step in the right direction. I think uh, talking about, you know, uh, especially women in, in hostile environments where there can be uh, challenging or personal uh, attacks, um, it, and, and they drop off uh, as contributors um, is, a, is a really big problem. Um, and it's a big problem for uh, our projects because uh, we need women and we need women's perspectives and having more women editors, uh, more, more women participants is a, a big deal. Um, we need them, do, do women need 
us? Do women need to be participating in Wikimedia projects? Like, what is our pitch to them? I, I, I mean, yeah, obviously. I mean, we, <laughs> uh, we, uh, we need them for the same reason they need us, like that we as humanity need diverse perspectives and we need, uh, you know, it's, um, we know that people's interests vary um, and that gender is one of the ways people's interests vary. And, you know, it's, if, we, if we, all we are is a, a very small group of uh, male computer geek types, uh, there's loads of the world that we just aren't that interested in. It's just not our hobby, right? And we want all those perspectives. We want all kinds of people. And, um, and those people also need to be visible. And, uh, you know, the, it goes both ways. I mean, this is, this is a project for everyone. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. And I just think um, what's interesting is that if you work at an institution like a university, um, oftentimes there's very, well, not always, but, but sometimes there's very uh, clear procedures for things like harassment and there's laws that you have to follow. With community projects, it's a little different, right? right. And it's a little bit harder, actually, simply because you don't have an HR unit necessarily. And I've been um, seeing the Tor project and uh, a little bit the Debian project deal with community issues by creating things like a community council in Tor. Um, Debian has an anti-harassment team, right? And these are, first of all, really important moves because if someone feels like they um, are being harassed or there's some other incident, first of all, just having some recourse to be able to report it and talk about it is essential. But then how to solve it is not a straightforward thing. And these projects are struggling with that right now. Um, and hopefully if they kind of do succeed, and it might take a couple of years to come up with procedures. I mean, with Debian, it took them one year to come up with a procedure for how to integrate new members of a project, right? And so it was a kind of very clever, set of um, testing procedures that they decided to do. It was one year. And so maybe for some of these procedures for Tor and, and Debian, it'll take a couple years. Um, and then once they exist, it would be good to kind of get them out in the world yep. to it's help other projects start to deal with it because it's much tougher for uh, community projects than uh, employer-based projects. Yeah, it takes us a long time too. I mean, our code of conduct took a very long time to right? To, to work out, and uh, uh, and that's problematic. Um, on the other hand, the strength of that kind of a process is that at the end, you do tend to end up with something that's quite nuanced and robust mm -hmm. and actually does manage to handle the complications around a lot of ambiguities. Uh, you know, I mean, one of the things we face in within the Wikipedia context, just purely from the Wikipedia editing context, is uh, you know, everybody assumes we'll have a lot of trouble with trolls. Trolls are super easy, just ban them. Like, <laughs> vandalism, ban, ban, ban. The hard ones are the people who are doing really good work, but they're just unbelievably annoying. Uh, <laughs> because then you, you end up with uh, people with different perspectives of like, well, we can't really ban because, I mean, it's amazing what they're doing on this obscure area of Wikipedia. On the other hand, are they driving away more people than they're helping, et cetera, et cetera. And it, that ends up being very uh, judgment call. And so a policy which is too simplistic can't account for, okay, what about a person who just, they just need a little social help, right? right. You can, if, as long as somebody can adopt them and kind of help them not be too annoying, uh, maybe that'll be all right. You know, it's, it's nuanced and it's complicated. And, and written policies to deal with that are, it takes a long time to get it right. Um, yeah, yeah. It's a, um, <clears throat> so I think that that, you know, that, that question um, of how we, how, how we do encourage that diversity, you can mark that off on your bingo cards. Um, <laughs> how we do encourage diversity is, is, really, uh, is really important. I think the other aspect of it is that, uh, you know, small l liberal tradition of ideas about freedom of speech, that, uh, that uh, we should be, that everyone kind of has a right to participate, that we can solve problems through discussion, 
Um, and these are you know, things that in a lot of ways are the underlying uh, base of our projects kind of depend on without us necessarily thinking about them. And there are also issues that are kind of under, under threat in 2017. The idea that debate and discussion is good for society and good for a project is no longer universally accepted. Um, what are, what does the changing role of uh, discussion, discourse, and freedom uh, in projects like, like Wikipedia? I mean, I, I don't think those ideas are very much under threat in this room, right, right. with the Wikipedia community, because we all know the value of um, chewing on things and debating and, and, and in good faith debating and, and really trying uh, to explore ideas and try to get it right and understand the nuances and things like that. We're, we're, that's very robust. Where I do see uh, a real problem is um, to the extent that breaks down elsewhere, then people begin to assume that because Wikipedia doesn't echo mindlessly the narrative you heard about climate change on Fox News, that we're some kind of, we're part of the left-wing conspiracy or whatever it might be. Um, and you can go in the other direction and find examples from the left, although rarer. Um, and to the extent that then people, if people begin to assume that all writing is biased and partisan at its core, then you, you begin to break down trust. And you can concede that, of course, all writing has a, has a bias to some extent, but there is a difference between really trying hard to be as neutral as you can, really trying hard to be as fact-based as you can, and just going crazy. Um, then, then there's hope. Um, and and I, I actually think a lot of what people are saying about post-truth world and all of that is, it's not like human beings have fundamentally changed. People still do value good, solid information. Wikipedia is unbelievably popular, uh, even in the face of being extremely uncompetitive on certain metrics of clickbait headlines and things like that. I mean, you know, we're 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 not shareable content in the you know uh, in the way that you would you see so many outlets pursuing, and yet people still come to Wikipedia because they they just want the facts. Yeah, so um, I do think this is an interesting moment. It's not the first moment where, as you know, you said, um, Jimmy, people in this room uh, see the value of dialogue, debate, um, and I work at a university that has many of the same values. But I think this moment is important because it does show that while we can't give these up, they may not be enough necessarily always to convince people of the truth, right? That sometimes, you know, simply confronting other ideas, even if they're right, it's important, it's necessary, um, but people come from very different positions, they have certain biases, um, certain kind of visions of the world, and this will color the way that they interpret things. And so there's this kind of idea that part of the problem in terms of post-truth is that people are in their little filter bubble. And that's true to some degree, but actually if you read some of the kind of news coming out of the alt-right conservative world, they first of all link to the New York Times, to the Huffington Post, right? They're quoting them. And so they're confronting um, that material and um, they're just interpreting it quite differently. And there was this one moment where this really hit home for me. It was when Sally Yates was um, uh, giving her testimony in Congress, and um, the kind of liberal progressive Twitterverse was like, Sally Yates is killing it, she's awesome. And then I was also following uh, the conservative kind of feeds, and they're like, Ted Cruz is killing it. Um, Sally Yates is doing terrible. And we were seeing the same thing, right? And I think it's just really important to confront this um, because the work of um, creating dialogue or consensus sometimes has to exceed putting information out there, even though I do think that's a base requirement. And as an educator, I do think um, 
this is a particularly important place for that to happen because with students, I actually see them you know, multiple times a week. And that's a sustained, long-term kind of practical conversation. And it's that sustained um, conversation in person, face-to-face, uh, -face, that matters as much as sort of confronting different information out there, which may or may not convince people. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm glad that we uh, got around to US politics. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, we, we, we took a while to it, get to it, um, because it's one of, the, uh, one of the main questions on the, the questions page. I'd like to thank everyone who's been footnoting the questions in the question page, like getting those citations in there, very important. Um, uh, one of the questions, from the early days of Wikipedia, we've taken advantage of the relative freedoms of publishing, copyright, and libel law hosting the project in the U.S. The U.S. has really been the gold standard you, for... Yeah. Uh, for publishing freedom. Uh, if those laws become more hostile, what are the community's options? Well, I mean, that's, that's a tough question. Um, so I think we can, we can look at and, and, and take a realistic approach to which pieces of those are likely to become more hostile. So one, I mean, the First Amendment is the First Amendment, and we're unlikely to see any law passed uh, requiring us to take down content critical of Donald Trump, right? That is mm -hmm. that is not at risk uh, yet. Um, until we see him arrest the Supreme Court, then that's a whole other, <laughs> we're in a whole other world there. But there are, uh, you know, things about, uh, you know, Section 230, so intermediary liability, where uh, that is not automatic in the law. That could be changed. It could be changed in ways that are incredibly detrimental to our work. You know, right now, uh, the community does a fantastic job. I mean, uh, the, the, if you look at our transparency report, the number of takedowns that the Wikimedia Foundation um, honors is microscopic, but also the number of complaints we get compared to other platforms is microscopic, and that's because the community does a fantastic job of policing copyright violations and so on and so forth. But let's imagine that the Wikimedia Foundation, if a user posts a copyright violation, and the community takes it down, but it was up for five minutes, and yet the foundation could be sued for millions for that breach, meaning we would have to have staff pre-approve everything that's posted. It would destroy Wikipedia. That's not likely to happen, because obviously there are powerful interests alongside us. Um, well, there's powerful interests including us, because we would go black for a day and freak everybody out, but, um, <laughs> but, but there, there, there could be shifts in the law in the US that could make it harder for us to do our work, and the problem is there aren't that many jurisdictions around the world who um, would be easy. I mean, Europe has a, a, a lot of problems. Uh, Canada has a lot of problems. Um, and uh, it, it becomes quite tricky. And I think this is an area where um, we need to be, continue to be proactive uh, at explaining um, why a certain legal framework is necessary in order for Wikipedia to, to thrive. Uh, and, and sort of making the foundation responsible for everything that everyone does isn't an answer, even though it might feel like an answer to the problems of Twitter, for example, um, even though there I would say it's a bad idea. Okay. Yeah, Good. that was thorough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, yeah, I think that's a, it's a very interesting question, and I think it's one as, as, the, uh, as the project has continuously grown more international, uh, the, the questions around uh, uh, leadership from Western European uh, culture, from North American culture, is, is something that's, that's really interesting there. I mean, maybe I'll add a small thing, though. Go to it. I mean, there has been some kind of, there have been some threats against journalists in the United States, right? Yeah. Um, with phones being tapped, with the Associated Press, and also, you know, they're supposed to have very strong source protections. Um, the journalists are supposed to be able to not have to reveal their uh, sources, but, you know, Obama went after folks like James Risen very strongly. And I just think it's, you know, again, what's so important about this community is that there is a community that has a lot of affinities with journalism, even if it's not journalism, that can precisely support each other at moments when those press freedoms are under attack. Yeah, and that's the kind of, I think there, there's some indirect danger to the project. It's not like 
Wikipedia itself is directly undermined, but to the extent that journalism is undermined, right, then, then clearly our sources are not as good and, and knowledge uh, becomes uh, not as high quality and so forth. So, so there's a, uh, a, another question which I really like and I'm going to read here. It was how, we can, how can we bring back the positivism and progressivism that was dominating the first 20 years of the web? Uh, and I kind of want to asterisk that and, and first ask, is there actually a golden age of the internet or the web that we're passing out of? Um, and you know, is it important for us to reach back to it and, and get back to it for both of you? I mean, uh, for me, I'm, I always say I'm a pathological optimist, so I think everything's <laughs> fine. Uh, I, don't, I, I think it's quite easy to look back with nostalgia on an era and forget that it wasn't great uh, in lots of ways. And um, I, I, mean, I don't think we're, we're passing out of a golden age of the web. I mean, there are threats and there are dangers um, for sure. Uh, certainly the, the rise of walled garden platforms and things like that has been problematic, although the walled gardens aren't that walled um, as much as people might have feared at some point. And uh, I think we're all right still. Yeah, I mean, it is, I think, very easy to paint the past as this like rosy time. But I mean, one of the great things about the present compared to the past is way more people are online doing things, finding each other. There are very different types of communities from uh, people with illnesses who, who kind of connect and share information um, to all sorts of political communities, right? Like we, that's what we wanted and that's what's happening. And when you get the world on the internet, you get the world's problems on the internet as well, right? And a lot of what we see, which is horrible, has to do with the fact that you know humans are complicated and do a lot of horrible things as well as wonderful things as well. But I think one of the great things about the online world is that software is still a lot easier to make and change than physical infrastructure. Um, you know, Montreal is famous for being under constant construction. Yeah. And um, it is just a nightmare when they pull down massive highways that are going through the city and everything's really disruptive and it costs so much money <laughs> and it takes forever. And with software, um, yes, there's a lot of problems, right? But um, there are ways in which a kind of software solution can be easier to erect or fix than a kind of a cement infrastructural one, right? And that just gives me a little bit of optimism um, that solutions sometimes can be more realistic to implement and change on the internet so long as people are allowed to um, connect to the internet and attach software. As long as you can't, you don't have to ask permission for that. Yeah. It's a slightly more kind of dynamic egalitarian space, mm -hmm. even though there's all sorts of problems with the internet as well. Yeah. I mean, this is like one of the things that I'm, I, I think is, is a remarkable positive change in the last few years is the, that encrypted chat apps is pretty much the norm. Like everybody uses yeah. WhatsApp and Telegram and so on. And the idea that a government yep. might ban encryption is just, I mean, it's a joke now. It's completely absurd. Right. Um, and they occasionally, in the UK, they saber rattle about this from time to time. But it's like, yeah, right, sure. You know, yeah. right? You're not going to do that. It's stupid. Uh, whereas that wasn't always so clear. You know, yeah. the idea of, I mean, trying to do PGP email is still a freaking nightmare. You know, it's hard. But most people now have completely easy access to very good quality encryption, and they use it. Yeah. And, and that means the public doesn't think of it as something crazy terrorists are doing off in a corner, right? Yeah. Um, they just think, oh, right, yeah. it just means my chats are secure. Right. Yeah. And I think that's a great example, precisely, right? Where in some ways, a lot of the pieces were in place, people were working towards it, and then the right political conditions, i.e. Snowden, yeah. and the revelations came into being. Um, and it kind of accelerated the process, and precisely, it's far more common today. And the, I think the important thing is, again, to make sure that we have a robust community of people who want to contribute to these projects, right? right. Because still, um, a number of these projects are community-driven, um, and 
you know, it's not necessarily the case in, in 40 years that you will have a kind of robust um, community of geeks, librarians, technologists contributing to these community projects. So it's always important to think about the health of the community because they're the ones feeding into these really important projects. So uh, we're, we're running out of time and I, I have one final question, uh, which is, you know, kind of stems from our previous discussion about uh, Basil Kartavel. Uh, who, you know, I, I think for me as someone who's always participated in free culture projects from a safe place of privilege uh, in the Western world, um, it's kind of an honor to have someone like that as a, as a colleague and as a kind of fellow, fellow traveler. Um, and I, I guess what I wanted to ask for both of you is that there are, you know, thousands of people like Basel out there right now doing this work in conflict zones, in, uh, in repressive regimes, in anocracies. Like, what would you, if you were, well we are, if you were speaking directly to those people right now, what would you, what would you say to them? Uh, be careful, uh, be safe, uh, encryption, uh, be careful about your identity online. Um, be thoughtful about these kinds of things. I actually want to mention, I, I think he's here in the room, Hossein Direction, who I've met at the very first uh, Wikimania in Frankfurt, I think it's the first time we met in person, uh, spent several years in prison in Iran and is free now. And for a long time we worried about what would happen to him. Uh, so talk to someone like him. Uh, he's here. Is he here? Hello? He's not raising his hand, so maybe he's outside talking to people. but. Um, you know, they're, they're, it's important, like, if you're, if you're working in a difficult area, uh, talk to others who've been through it and talk to others about best practices and things like that to be, to be safe um, and, and make sure uh, the foundation is aware of you and so we can try to help if something happens. But the best thing is don't get arrested in the first place. That's my advice. Yeah, and it, it's um, often the case sometimes, I mean, this, I'm a little bit, more familiar with like the hacker world where some people are, are taking risks and there was a lot of arrests in 2011 and 12 and a, a lot less today. I mean, sadly, sometimes certain tragedies um, are these uh, visible flashpoints and um, best practices do kind of emerge from them after. Um, and there are the tools um, that help with this, but it, it requires extreme discipline as well to have uh, good security, and it's a kind of constant process as well that one can never let go of. Um, but oftentimes these strategies can be the basis for, um, you know, I guess learning uh, and education so in the future people can be better protected, and hopefully that will happen from this. Awesome. Well, uh, Jimmy, Biella, thank you very much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And thanks, everyone. Thank you. Amazing. All right. Do I have a mic? Uh, before you